Cockermouth and Keswick by Robert Louis Stevenson. Very much as a painter half closes his eyes so that some salient unity may disengage itself from among the crowd of details and what he sees may thus form itself into a whole, very much on the same principle, I may say, I allow a considerable lapse of time to intervene between any of my little journeyings and the attempt to chronicle them. I cannot describe a thing that is before me at the moment, or that has been before me only a very little while before. I must allow my recollections to get thoroughly strained free from all the chaff till nothing be except the pure gold. Allow my memory to choose out what is truly memorable by a process of natural selection. And I piously believe that in this way I ensure the survival of the fittest. If I make notes for future use, or if I am obliged to write letters during the course of my little excursion, I so interfere with the process that I can never again find out what it is worthy of being preserved or what should be given in full length, what in torso or what merely in profile. This process of incubation may be unreasonably prolonged, and I am somewhat afraid that I have made this mistake with the present journey. Like a bad daguerreotype, great part of it has been entirely lost. I can tell you nothing about the beginning and nothing about the end, but the doings of some fifty or sixty hours about the middle remain quite distinct and definite, like a little patch of sunshine on a long shadowy plain, or the one spot on an old picture that has been restored by the dexterous hand of the cleaner. I remember a tale of an old Scots minister called upon suddenly to preach, who had hastily snatched an old sermon out of his study and found himself in the pulpit before he noticed that the rats had been making free with his manuscript and eaten the first two or three pages away. He gravely explained to the congregation how he found himself situated. And now, said he, let us just begin where the rats have left off. I must follow the divine's example and take up the thread of my discourse where it first distinctly issues from the limbo of forgetfulness. Cockermouth I was lighting my pipe as I stepped out of the inn at Cockermouth and did not raise my head until I was fairly in the street. When I did so, it flashed upon me that I was in England. The evening sunlight lit up the English houses, English faces, an English conformation of street, as it were. An English atmosphere blew against my face. There is nothing perhaps more puzzling, if one thing in sociology can ever really be more unaccountable than another, than the great gulf that is set between England and Scotland, a gulf so easy in appearance, in reality so difficult to traverse. Here are two people, almost identical in blood, pent up together on one small island, so that their intercourse, one would have thought, must be as close as that of prisoners who shared one cell of the Bastille. The same in language and religion, and yet a few years of quarrelsome isolation, a mere forenoon's tiff, as one may call it, in comparison with the great historical cycles, has so separated their thoughts and ways that not unions, not mutual dangers, nor steamers, nor railways, nor all the king's horses and all the king's men seem able to obliterate the broad distinction. In the trituration of another century or so, the corners may disappear. But in the meantime... In the year of grace, 1871, I was as much in a new country as if I had been walking out of the Hotel St. Antoine at Antwerp. I felt a little thrill of pleasure at my heart as I realized the change and strolled away up the street with my hands behind my back, noting in a dull, sensual way how foreign and yet how friendly were the slopes of the gables and the color of the tiles and even the demeanor and voices of the gossips around me. Wandering in this aimless humor, I turned up a lane and found myself following the course of the bright little river. I passed first one and then another, then a third, several couples out love-making in the spring evening, and a consequent feeling of loneliness was beginning to grow upon me when I came to a dam across the river and a mill, a great gaunt promontory of building, half on dry ground and half arched over the stream. The road here drew in its shoulders and crept through between the landward extremity of the mill and a little garden enclosure with a small house and a large signboard within its privet hedge. I was pleased to fancy this an inn, and drew little etchings in fancy of a sanded parlour and three-coloured spittoons and a society of parochial gossips seated within over their church wardens. But as I drew near, the board displayed its superscription, and I could read the name of Smethurst and the designation of Canadian Felt Hat Manufacturers. 
there was no more hope of evening fellowship, and I could only stroll on by the riverside under the trees. The water was dappled with slanting sunshine and dusted all over with a little mist of flying insects. There were some amorous ducks, also, whose love-making reminded me of what I had seen a little farther down. But the road grew sad, and I grew weary, and as I was perpetually haunted with the terror of a return of the tie that had been playing such ruin in my head a week ago, I turned and went back to the inn and supper and my bed. The next morning at breakfast I communicated to the smart waitress my intention of continuing down the coast and through Whitehaven to Furness, and, as I might have expected, I was instantly confronted by that last and most worrying form of interference that chooses to introduce tradition and authority into the choice of a man's own pleasures. I can excuse a person combating my religious or philosophical heresies, because them I have deliberately accepted and am ready to justify by present argument. But I do not seek to justify my pleasures. If I prefer tame scenery to grand, a little hot sunshine over lowland parks and woodlands to the war of the elements round the summit of Mount Blanc, or if I prefer a pipe of mild tobacco and the company of one or two chosen companions to a ball where I find myself very hot, awkward, and weary, I merely state these preferences as facts and do not seek to establish them as principles. This is not the general rule, however, and accordingly the waitress was shocked, as one might be at a heresy, to hear the route that I had sketched out for myself. Everybody who came to Cockermouth for pleasure, it appears, went on to Keswick. It was in vain that I put up a little plea for the liberty of the subject. It was in vain that I said I should prefer to go to Whitehaven. I was told that there was nothing to see there, that weary, hackneyed, old falsehood, and at last, as the handmaiden began to look really concerned, I gave way, as men always do in such circumstances, and agreed that I was to leave for Keswick by a train in the early evening. An Evangelist Cockermouth itself, on the same authority, was a place with nothing to see. Nevertheless, I saw a good deal and retain a pleasant, vague picture of the town and all its surroundings. I might have dodged happily enough all day about the main street and up to the castle and in and out of byways, but the curious attraction that leads a person in a strange place to follow, day after day, the same round, and to make set habits for himself in a week or ten days, led me half unconsciously up the same road that I had gone the evening before. When I came up to the hat manufactory, Smethurst himself was standing in the garden gate. He was brushing one Canadian felt hat, and several others had been put to await their turn, one above the other, on his own head, so that he looked something like the typical Jew old clothes man. As I drew near, he came sidling out of the doorway to accost me with so curious an expression on his face that I instantly prepared myself to apologize for some unwitting trespass. His first question rather confirmed me in this belief, for it was whether or not he had seen me going up this way last night, and after having answered in the affirmative, I waited in some alarm for the rest of my indictment. But the good man's heart was full of peace, and he stood there brushing his hats and prattling on about fishing and walking and the pleasures of convalescence in a bright, shallow stream that kept me pleased and interested, I could scarcely say how. As he went on, he warmed to his subject and laid his hats aside to go along the waterside and show me where the large trout commonly lay underneath an overhanging bank, and he was much disappointed, for my sake, that there were none visible just then. Then he wandered off on to another tack, and stood a great while out in the middle of a meadow in the hot sunshine, trying to make out that he had known me before, or, if not me, some friend of mine, merely, I believe, out of a desire that we should feel more friendly and at our ease with one another. At last he made a little speech to me, of which I wish I could recollect the very words, for they were so simple and unaffected that they put all the best writing and speaking to the blush. As it is, I can recall only the sense, and that perhaps imperfectly. He began by saying that he had little things in his past life that gave him a special pleasure to recall, and that the faculty of receiving such sharp impressions had now died out in himself, but must at my age be still quite lively and active. Then he told me that he had a little raft afloat on the river above the dam which he was going to lend me in order that I might be able to look back in after years upon having done so and get great pleasure from the recollection. Now, I have a friend of my own who will forego present enjoyments and suffer much present inconvenience for the sake of manufacturing a reminiscence for himself. 
but there was something singularly refined in this pleasure that the hat-maker found in making reminiscences for others. Surely no more simple or unselfish luxury can be imagined. After he had unmoored his little embarkation and seen me safely shoved off into midstream, he ran away back to his hats with the air of a man who had only just recollected that he had anything to do. I did not stay very long on the raft. It ought to have been very nice punting about there in the cool shade of the trees, or sitting moored to an overhanging roof, but perhaps the very notion that I was bound in gratitude especially to enjoy my little cruise and cherish its recollection turned the whole thing from a pleasure into a duty. Be that as it may, there is no doubt that I soon wearied and came ashore again, and that it gives me more pleasure to recall the man himself and his simple happy conversation, so full of gusto and sympathy, than anything possibly connected with his crank, insecure embarkation. In order to avoid seeing him, for I was not a little ashamed of myself for having failed to enjoy his treat sufficiently, I determined to continue up the river, and, at all prices, to find some other way back into the town in time for dinner. As I went, I was thinking of Smethurst with admiration. A look into that man's mind was like a retrospect over the smiling champagne of his past life, and very different from the Sinai gorges of which one looks for a terrified moment into the dark souls of many good, many wise, and many prudent men. I cannot be very grateful to such men for their excellence in wisdom and prudence. I find myself facing as stoutly as I can a hard, combative existence full of doubt, difficulties, defeats, disappointments, and dangers, quite a hard enough life without their dark countenances at my elbow, so that what I want is a happy-minded Smethurst placed here and there at ugly corners of my life's wayside, preaching his gospel of quiet and contentment. Another I was shortly to meet with an evangelist of another stamp. After I had forced my way through a gentleman's grounds, I came out on the high road and sat down to rest myself on a heap of stones at the top of a long hill, with Cockermouth lying snugly at the bottom. An Irish beggar woman with a beautiful little girl by her side came up to ask for alms, and gradually fell to telling me the little tragedy of her life. Her own sister, she told me, had seduced her husband from her after many years of married life, and the pair had fled, leaving her destitute with the little girl upon her hands. She seemed quite hopeful and cheery, and though she was unaffectedly sorry for the loss of her husband's earnings, she made no pretense of despair at the loss of his affection. Some day she would meet the fugitives, and the law would see her duly righted, and in the meantime the smallest contribution was gratefully received. While she was telling all this in the most matter-of-fact way, I had been noticing the approach of a tall man with a high white hat and darkish clothes. He came up the hill at a rapid pace and joined our little group with a sort of half-salutation. Turning at once to the woman, he asked her in a business-like way whether she had anything to do, whether she were a Catholic or a Protestant, whether she could read and so forth, and then, after a few kind words and some sweeties to the child, he dispatched the mother with some tracts about Biddy and the priest and the Orangeman's Bible. I was a little amused at his abrupt manner, for he was still a young man and had something the air of a navy officer, but he tackled me with great solemnity. I could make fun of what he said, for I do not think it was very wise, but the subject does not appear to me just now in a jesting light. So, I shall only say that he related to me his own conversion, which had been effected, as is very often the case, through the agency of a gig accident, and that, after having examined me and diagnosed my case, he selected some suitable tracts from his repertory, gave them to me, and, bidding me Godspeed, went on his way. Last of Smethurst that evening I got into a third-class carriage on my way for Keswick, and was followed almost immediately by a burly man in brown clothes. This fellow passenger was seemingly ill at ease, and kept continually putting his head out of the window and asking the bystanders if they saw him coming. At last, when the train was already in motion, there was a commotion on the platform, and a way was left clear to our carriage door. He had arrived. In the hurry, I could just see Smethurst, red and panting, thrust a couple of clay pipes into my companion's outstretched hand, and hear him crying his farewells after us, as we slipped out of the station at an ever-accelerating pace. I said something about it being a close run, and the broad man, already engaged in filling one of the pipes, assented, and went on to tell me of his own stupidity in forgetting a necessary, and of how his friend had good-naturedly gone downtown at the last moment to supply the omission. 
I mentioned that I had seen Mr. Smethurst already, and that he had been very polite to me, and we fell into a discussion of the Hatter's merits that lasted some time and left us quite good friends at its conclusion. The topic was productive of goodwill. We exchanged tobacco and talked about the season, and agreed at last that we should go to the same hotel at Keswick and sup in company. As he had some business in the town which would occupy him some hour or so, on our arrival I was to improve the time and go down to the lake that I might see a glimpse of the promised wonders. The night had fallen already when I reached the waterside at a place where many pleasure boats are moored and ready for hire, and as I went along a stony path between wood and water, a strong wind blew in gusts from the far end of the lake. The sky was covered with flying scud, and, as this was ragged, there was quite a wild chase of shadow and moon glimpse over the surface of the shuddering water. I had to hold my hat on, and was growing rather tired and inclined to go back in disgust, when a little incident occurred to break the tedium. A sudden and violent squall of wind sundered the low underwood, and at the same time there came one of those brief discharges of moonlight which leaped into the opening thus made and showed me three girls in the prettiest flutter and disorder. It was as though they had sprung out of the ground. I accosted them very politely in my capacity of stranger, and requested to be told the names of all manner of hills and woods and places that I did not wish to know, and we stood together for a while and had an amusing little talk. The wind, too, made himself of the party, brought the color into their faces, and gave them enough to do to repress their drapery, and one of them, amid much giggling, had to pirouette round and round upon her toes, as girls do, when some specially strong gust had got the advantage over her. They were just high enough up in the social order not to be afraid to speak to a gentleman, and just low enough to feel a little tremor, a nervous consciousness of wrongdoing, of stolen waters, that gave a considerable zest to our most innocent interview. They were as much discomposed and fluttered, indeed, as if I had been a wicked baron proposing to elope with the whole trio. But they showed no inclination to go away, and I had managed to get them off hills and waterfalls and on to more promising subjects when a young man was described coming along the path from the direction of Keswick. Now whether he was the young man of one of my friends, or the brother of one of them, or indeed the brother of all, I do not know but they incontinently said that they must be going, and went away up the path with friendly salutations. I need not say that I found the lake and the moonlight rather dull after their departure, and speedily found my way back to potted herrings and whiskey and water in the commercial room with my late fellow traveller. In the smoking room there was a tall, dark man with a moustache, in an ulster coat, who had got the best place and was monopolising most of the talk, and, as I came in, a whisper came round to me from both sides that this was the manager of a London theatre. The presence of such a man was a great event for Keswick, and I must own that the manager showed himself equal to his position. He had a large, fat pocket-book, from which he produced poem after poem written on the backs of letters or hotel bills, and nothing could be more humorous than his recitation of these elegant extracts, except, perhaps, the anecdotes with which he varied the entertainment." seeing, I suppose, something less countrified in my appearance than in most of the company, he singled me out to corroborate some statements as to the depravity and vice of the aristocracy, and when he went on to describe some gilded saloon experiences, I am proud to say that he honoured my sagacity with one little covert wink before a second time appealing to me for confirmation. The wink was not thrown away. I went in up to the elbows with the manager until I think that some of the glory of that great man settled by reflection upon me, and that I was as noticeably the second person in the smoking room as he was the first. For a young man, this was a position of some distinction, I think you will admit. The End Read by Rick Kistner for